morning. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. How you doing? Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Happy 4th of July today. It's a great day to celebrate just uh, our nation's history of independence from other countries, which has given us a place to build a, a place of freedom, freedom for us to do this. I mean, this is a direct result of living in a, in a nation that's free, and I'm so thankful for that. So you know, we're giving thanks to, today for that, and we're joyful, and yet also we're acknowledging the kingdom of God, which is over us and in us and through us and growing through us as well. So would you join me in prayer as we begin our service, and then uh, when the prayer ends, I'll invite you to stand and worship with us. Father, thank you so much for... Uh, for your love. You, you've given us the ability to have freedom on this earth, uh, freedom to worship like this, freedom to lift up the name of Jesus, freedom to put you first. And yet we also just recognize your supreme authority. Uh, in no way does that take away from uh, our submission to you, our joy over your rule and reign as King of kings, Lord of lords. And Father, we just look forward to seeing you uh, expand your influence and reign upon this earth, starting right here in our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us and sing today.
Father, this morning we openly and freely admit our need for you. We're nothing without you, Lord. You have loved us, called us to yourself, offered us salvation, washed all of our sins away, brought us into your presence brought us into your church. Lord, until we are resurrected and perfected for eternity by you, there are many ways in which we need you now so desperately. We'll need you then too, but we're dependent on you for every breath that we take. Every thought in our mind, every attitude in our heart. Lord, we need you as much now as we ever have. And so I pray, Lord, that you would meet us here, reveal your presence to us, help us to become more like Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks, worship team. They're going to lead us in a couple of songs after the message today, but a couple of announcements first. Um, we've got no children's church today, so they'll be right in here with us, and we'll just enjoy that family feel. Um, tomorrow evening at 6 is a prayer for the lost gathering at the church office, and so uh, come and pray for anybody who you would want to lift up before the Lord, uh, that they would come to the Lord or come back to the Lord uh, registration is open for the Great Fishing Getaway later in July, ages 10 and up. Uh, that is such a good time to go camping and just hang out around the campfire, have some great food, uh, enjoy some fishing together. August Blast registration is open. Um, looking for Chris. I think he's still out here handing out shirts for the Ensenada team. Uh, and also the Haitian Hustle registration is open. So uh, make sure you're, you're aware of those things. There's some women's ministry groups. I think there's still room to get in on those as well. And so find ways to connect this summer and, and enjoy being together with God's people. Uh, as we pray, I'm going to lift up Toby Nelson. He's recovering from some surgeries this week. Uh, there's uh, 
Megan says today, if he will eat, walk, and shower today, they'll let him come home today. So we're praying that he'll be able to muster up the strength to do those things. And then the Ensenada Entourage team leaves from the church office on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. And so I just want to let you know about that. If you would want to come, um, they're going to have a lot to do with organizing luggage and all that kind of stuff. But if you just want to come and stay back and just pray and just kind of pray them off, I just want to invite you to come. Feel free to do that as well as they get ready to head out. So let's pray for, for some of those things this morning. Father, thank you for your word that we can gather around and study and individually in pairs and in groups, and I'm so thankful to see uh, people doing that. I pray that you will just plant your word deep in our hearts. Father, this, this morning we lift up Toby Nelson as he's recovering from surgery, and I pray that you'll give him strength today and courage uh, to be able to overcome his fears and, and get up and move and do what he needs to do. Uh, we, would, we would love to see him come home today if that's your will, but we pray for protection over his body and for strength and for healing. And we lift up the Ensenada team as they prepare to leave uh, later this week, and just pray for all those final preparations that you will oversee those details and help that to go smoothly. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, sir. He is coming home this afternoon. Great. Good. Toby will be coming home. Thank you, Grandpa. Awesome. So pray, pray for that to go well. This morning we are in Revelation chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, how many of you I'm seeing some Bibles? Good, bring your Bibles to church. Um, I love having a Bible on my phone. It makes it easy to look something up quickly. Um, but I love the Word of God in print as well. I can mark and highlight and read it and pick up where I left off. I um, just want to encourage you to bring a Bible. Revelation chapter 2. Verses 1 through 7. That is a picture of, of Ephesus, by the way. Ephesus was a wealthy and gorgeous city. Um, and that was one of the, the, today, one of the ruins of one of their theaters that they have. If you look online, anybody ever been to Ephesus? Uh, you can look up online, like ruins or history. It's fascinating to see how much was going on in that city so long ago. But I'd like to read the... Uh, the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Father, would you bless the, the reading of your word today? And would you bless the ears that hear it? Help us, Father, to continue to read and listen to Revelation and, and be impacted by the force of all that you had to say to us in it. Lord, as we open up this particular piece of it today, I pray for your wisdom. And for your Holy Spirit to be at work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember about how many churches are mentioned in the New Testament? I think I've asked you this before. There's quite a few. I think there's around 40. 
uh, who are mentioned specifically, most of those very specific churches. Some of those are kind of more the believers scattered around in a, in a region, but there's around 40 different groups. Here we come to a place where there are seven letters written specifically to seven churches. It's interesting, as a lot of Revelation, as you know, is um, metaphors or symbols for different things. There have been a lot of theories as to what are these seven letters to seven churches all about. And one of the older theories uh, is that these seven different letters are kind of an allegory describing the church age. Uh, the first one describing the first age of the church and then later ages. And that's a kind of a common one, which is why I mention it. It harkens back a little bit to Jan Daniel chapter 2. Do you remember King Nebuchadnezzar has this crazy dream about a statue? And Daniel's like, well, the Lord would show me what that means. The statue had a golden head, a silver chest and arms, abs of bronze. I think that could be a new name for a workout video, abs of bronze. Um, and then there were legs of iron and feet had iron and clay mixed. And Daniel says, these are different kingdoms, Nebuchadnezzar. You are the head of gold. But after you will come a kingdom like this and another one like this. And he kind of describes it. Some have applied that to here. To think that maybe this is what it's talking about. But, but most who study this don't end up holding to that theory. I don't hold to that theory at all. When we see what what John is doing, or Jesus is doing, and giving John these seven letters to these seven churches, uh, these were seven actual churches that were located in Asia Minor. I put some arrows on for you. You can see somewhere down in there, one of those islands is the island of Patmos, where John was exiled to. And the letters that John writes uh, in the book of Revelation are in this order. First, he writes the letter to the church of Ephesus, then Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Cyrus, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. That was a common trade route back in that day. And so we can pretty easily get the idea that John wrote the entire book of Revelation, and then there was a separate section for each of these churches, and then that whole thing would be given to the courier who would travel across the sea and go to the church in Ephesus where it would be read out loud before the whole church with one section being addressed specifically to them. Maybe they made a copy of it before they sent it on uh, or maybe the copies were made later, but they would have sent that on and it went over to the church in Smyrna where they did the same thing and it traveled around and made an impact on each one of these churches, each one getting their own separate word, but maybe more importantly, each one getting the whole thrust of the book of Revelation. These were churches under persecution, and, and Revelation's idea is basically life stinks. The world is a hard place to live in. Be faithful. Be strong. Christ is coming, and he will set things right. So be ready. So I think also we've talked about the letter 7 as being an important representative of the whole. So I think each church, including ours and every church that's read the book of Revelation since, has things to learn from each one of these seven letters to seven different churches. I don't think that we would need our own letter from the Lord today. I think that this would give this. In fact, I was just listening online through Right Now Media, uh, to David Platt. He, preach, he preaches for like 65 minutes, by the way. Uh, so jump in on his sermons if you want a little longer. But he just covered Revelation, all seven letters to all seven churches, all mashed up in one sermon. It was kind of interesting, just taking different themes from it. But we're going to look at each one separately. He begins by saying to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. John says, I just gave you this vision of Jesus 
standing among the seven golden lampstands, as you hear these letters, don't, don't lose sight of that. He invites us back into that. So we see Jesus walking among the churches, trimming wicks, fanning into flame, and tending to them, and caring, caring for them. Question for you. Who do these churches belong to? A Sunday school answer will suffice. They belong to Christ. They are His. Every single person who will ever go to heaven will go there and be a part of God's family, will go there by one way and one way only, trusting Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. There is no other way. Every single person who will ever be called family of God comes into the family through their sins dying on the cross through Jesus and life coming through the resurrection of Christ. There's no other way. Jesus purchased every one of us. We are his. Jesus gathered them into churches that he calls his body and his bride. Every church belongs to him. They're his and he is walking among them tending them, and caring for them. As he gives each of these letters, they have a, some similar format. Most of them will say, here are some things you're doing well. Here are some things that need to be changed. So let's take a look first at what this particular church in Ephesus was doing well. I'm going to read verses 2 and 3 and verse 6, because he tucks another affirmation in a little bit later. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary you also have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he first affirms them for their hard work and perseverance, which he knows. There are some different ways to say Jesus knows something. Like, hey, I heard about your hard work. I heard about, that's one way. Like, I'm aware of this fact. But there's another way that this sense is, and the words that this uses to say, I know this because I'm there. I know this personally and intimately, that you guys work hard doing good things and you persevere. I know this. Some of you have worked really, really hard in your marriage. And it's been largely one way. You've done the lion's share of the work around the house taking care of things, and trying to be the spouse you're supposed to be. It can become lonely, but rest assured, Jesus is there with you, and he knows. He's seen every single thing you've done, everything you haven't done, and everything you've thought. And he values the work. He sees you. Some of you have worked hard in the church. You've faithfully taught a Sunday school class or uh, served in the nursery or led a group or mentored people, and you've done this for years. And I just want to let you know that is so valuable. Jesus is there, and he sees it and appreciates all of it more than we know. I, I actually have... Uh, believe that the nursery is as important as the sanctuary in a church because there's something so important that serves a family so well during a time when they're stressed and tired. And people who've served there, that is so valuable. It opens up opportunities for other ministries for people. So thank you for whatever it is that you've done. Know that Christ sees it. Jesus says, I it says Jesus knows 
your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. And he wants to encourage the church. There's a second thing that he encourages the church over, and that is that he knows their theological purity. This church in, in Ephesus has stood against wicked people, false apostles. They stood against the Nickelodeons. That's what goes through my mind every time I hear this. The Nickelodeons. Remember Nickelodeon? I'd stand against that too. People coming into church spraying green slime on everything. They stood against these people that would corrupt what they believed. And now it's interesting in doing some, because I, I read this and go, the Nickel, what? I don't even know how to say it. I don't know anything about these folks. What were they teaching? So I looked it up and basically other people were saying, we don't really know either. That their false teaching wasn't really preserved. We don't really know what they were teaching. They do think that it was something that led to a form of syncretism where the believers in that day would say, hey, we like certain aspects of church. We kind of like this. We kind of like this. We feel good talking about God's love. Uh, we kind of like this program or we like this thing. So we'll take those things, but we also like some of these things that we get in our social circles outside of church which in their day would have to do with idolatry and, and uh, permissiveness. Um, we get to do what we want with my life, whether God calls it sin or not. And I'm going to build kind of this belief system that is a life that I want. That's really prevalent today. And this was a church that was able to say, the word of God teaches us how to live. Jesus said, come and die with me. Give your whole life and follow me completely. And they were faithful. They loved the truth. This church loved the truth, but in the end, over time, they ended up loving the truth more than they actually loved God. They ended up loving the truth more than they ended up actually loving the people around them. Which leads to this word of correction that Jesus gives. What they needed to change. Jesus said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you. And remove your lampstand from its place. Jesus knew long ago that people's first loves would fade. Back in Matthew 24, he said, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You ever had a time when an old flame began to dwindle? I think everyone who's married or has been married can relate to say, hey, I know what it was like when that flame was roaring. When you were first interested or dating or engaged or first married. And you can remember the things you did to nurture that flame. I won't ask for a raise of hands. But I bet most married couples can also remember a time when that, fl that flame began to fade. And when there was a, a realization we're not doing the things that we once did that built that early love. For some, it's long walks on the beach. Or a date night. Or just uh, uh, spending time talking. Do you remember talking? Remember that? Some couples used to talk to one another, and that was encouraging for their love. Do the things you did at first to fan that flame. What's this love that he's talking about for these believers? He doesn't say it's, it's love for God. He doesn't say it's love for people. And so we look at this, and I, I see back what did Jesus say when he was teaching? He wrapped them all together. Back in, in Mark 12, 
Jesus, once one of the teachers of the law, came and asked Jesus of all the commandments, which is the most important. The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So central, most important, greatest of all, is this idea that we love God with everything that we have, and we love our fellow man in a similar way. Love God and love people. A little bit later, Jesus added a third big love for his followers. Just before he went to his cross, he gathered his 12 disciples in the upper room. And he said to them, a new command I give you. This is in John 13. So the same guy wrote this, is wrote Revelation. A new command I give you. Added to the first and second. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another found that interesting. The churches are called lampstands. The light is fading in Ephesus. He's threatening to remove it because the love is how people will know that we're actually God's disciples. I think the love is the light of the church in many ways, along with the good works. Val bet is the 12 disciples were gathered in that secret church feeling upper room. And they're jotting down the things Jesus says, or probably somebody was. Matthew used to write things down. John obviously did as well. And they're remembering, and Jesus wanted to make sure that it didn't just burn into their minds, but into their hearts. As they gathered in that upper room, because it was kind of secretive, they didn't, nobody got a servant to come and wash their dusty feet as they came in or set the table. Or the, that was done before. And so they came into this room, and their feet are all kind of dirty, but they felt like, well, we'll just kind of come in here. And Jesus took off his shirt, wrapped a towel around his waist, and just took on the nature of a servant and washed 12 pairs of dirty feet, including the pair that would later that night betray him, including the pair that would later that night deny him. And almost all the rest were going to scatter and run away from him. Those are the feet that he washed. And he said, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Love for God. Love for the people around us in life. Love for one another in the church. Jesus said, I hold this against you. You have forsaken or forgotten the love you have at first. Consider, that word actually is remember. Remember, it's, it's, it's not so much consider how far you've fallen, It's remember where you've fallen from. Remember. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. One thing I'm terrible at, and that's driving my car and figuring out where to go when I'm distracted. If I have something on my mind, even if I have my phone yelling at me, turn left, I can't follow directions at all. I've gotten in my car before. My car, my truck has an autopilot. It's really advanced, even though it's an old truck. It has an autopilot, and I know it does, and I know the autopilot takes it here where we have church. And I've had times, even recently, I got in the car with one of my boys to take them to Monticello, and he's like, "Uh, Dad, where are you going? (laughs) We were on autopilot. I had to remember where I was supposed to be going. I had to stop, and I had to turn around and start going toward my goal. 
When we become aware that we're not loving God or our neighbors or one another, we need to remember Christ and his call to love. We need to stop and turn around. So let's today, let's today, I think we should pray. I think we should remember. Remember the love you had at first in your walk with God. Can you remember a time when you just, you felt so passionately in love with the Lord? What was, what was happening around that? What was nurturing that love? For some, it involves singing worship songs. For others, it involves being out in nature, seeing the glory and beauty of His handiwork. For some, it involves talking with other people about how awesome God is. Reading Scripture out loud together. Remember those times. And do the things you did at first to foster your love for God. What would happen if they found their first love? He closes the letter by saying, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We can hear the Word of God without really hearing it. He's obviously talking about, let this sink in. Let this make its impact. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Nurturing love today will produce fruit for tomorrow. Let's remember and return and do the things we once did. Father, thank you for this word of instruction to this church in Ephesus that all of us need to to come back and and listen to. It would be easy for anyone, as Jesus predicted, for our love to grow cold and still be doing the right things. Help us to do the right things out of a heart of love, but to keep first things first. Give us a vision today, Lord, just in our own private times, In our own minds, remind us of Jesus' love for us. We we can't love anything or anyone. You first loved us. So fill us with the love of Christ. Remind us, Lord, of how much Jesus did for us. Remind us of how much we've been forgiven. Remind us of the cross. And help us today on this Independence Day to have some moments of total dependence upon you. To get away and go somewhere privately and just pray and meditate on the cross. Rekindle our love for you and the people you put around us. In Jesus' name. you stand and give your heart to the Lord in worship.
That's awesome. Good job, worship team. Uh, go crazy today. Celebrate 4th of July and have fun. But somewhere in there, just take a few moments to get away from it all and just be alone with God and just talk to Him and assess where you are and make sure that God's grace that flows on America comes through His people. It always has. This nation is not a good nation because of our politics or whatever. This nation is a, is a strong nation because of the Christians and the churches who have stood on the truth and who advanced the kingdom of God growing here in this country. Be part of that. And that starts right here in our own hearts. So do that. Have an awesome day. Celebrate and worship the Lord as you enjoy yourself. Have a great week.